Rogan! She's strength. Fire burn and cauldron bubble. Something wicked this way comes. Greetings fellow fans of film and fiction. Just get the tree string out of your mouth. Greetings fellow fans of film and fiction and welcome to Broad Six Productions Worst to First. See it's a joke about the F word, funny. And we're back again this week with a weird little spot of light there to talk about Prisoner of Azkaban, which is like lots of people's one of their favourites in the series of Harry Potter films. So not only is this episode worst first special because we're reviewing that, it's also special because it's the episode that makes everyone unsubscribe from me because I don't agree with them, possibly. But before we get on with the comparatively simple plot of Prisoner of Azkaban, we have to finish off the ridiculously over-complex plot of Chamber of Secrets. g g, -g grapefruit Recap! So Harry and Ron find out that the girl that was killed 50 years ago was moaning Myrtle. So they go up there to the girl's bathroom to find a secret passage into the Chamber of Secrets because Ginny, Ron's little sister, has been taken into the chamber. So they find the entrance and they go into the chamber and obviously Ron and Harry get split up so Harry has to go on to the end on his own. When he gets there he finds this sort of ghostly memory form of Tom Marvolo Riddle talking to him. Tom tells Harry that the reason that Ginny is there is that she, Ginny, is the one that's been doing all this horrible shit all year. Because he, Tom, has had her under his control and has been making her do this because he's actually Lord Voldemort because if you mix around the words in Tom Marvolo Riddle you get I am Lord Voldemort anagram clever Ginny had Riddle's diary before Harry had it and Riddle has been using the diary to control Ginny's soul and now Riddle is using the diary to sap away Ginny's life force so that he can come back to power as Lord Voldemort Doc can you get that? I'll be right back Sorry, the phone was going off. So Harry tries to stop Tom, but Voldemort sends the monster of the chamber after Harry, and it is this big snake thing called a basilisk. Anyway, Harry kills it, then uses one of its fangs to stab the diary, and it kills Tom Riddle and brings Ginny back to life. When they're free, Harry meets up with Lucius Malfoy, and we work out that Lucius Malfoy is a dick, because when he took Ginny's book back in Diagon Alley, he slipped... Riddle's diary in with it, so he actually made the whole thing happen in the first place. And then, because Harry's really clever, he makes it so that Lucius accidentally frees Dobby, because Dobby was his house elf. Lucius gets all pissed off, points his wand at Harry, and goes, Avada! Which we don't know what it means, but we assume it's something scary. And before he can finish it, Dobby blasts him away and goes, You shall not harm Harry Potter! And you're like, Yes, Dobby! You are brilliant! Dumbledore tells Harry that the only reason that he can speak parcel tongue is because Voldemort put a bit of himself into Harry when he did that curse when he was a baby. Everyone gets unpetrified and Hagrid comes back from Azkaban and everyone is happy and I don't know, they probably win the house cup, I can't remember. The end. Woo! Plot. Now the plot for Prisoner is quite a weird one because not very much happens for most of it and then tons happens right at the end. So if I want to give an overview of the plot, I kind of have to dip into the ending. And as the most exciting bits kind of happen after the big spoilers at the end, I might have to give some shit away. So bear that in mind, if you haven't seen this film, there will be moderate spoilers in this little plot summary. Hello! Can you not put this in? <laughs> Can I not put what in? That was today's special guest, Dot! Hello, Dot! said fuck off George. I love my sister. So Prisoner of Azkaban starts with, as is now tradition, a Hogwarts student doing spells outside of school. I just, are they even trying anymore? Yes, Harry Potter is under his sheets playing about with his wand and making masses of white stuff come out. Subtle, Warner Brothers. Harry is again staying with his aunt and uncle and evil cousin, and his other aunt, who isn't really his aunt, comes over to stay for dinner. This is the brilliant Pam Ferris playing Aunt Marge, as in Marjorie, Fromage, Frey, Marge Mallow, and Marge is fat. And food, food, Marge, food, food. She says some nasty stuff about his parents, so in a hilarious set piece, he makes her blow up and get all big and fat, and then, and then go like helium to the top of the room and float out of the room, and it's brilliant, and everyone laughs. So obviously his aunt and uncle aren't very happy about that, so Harry runs away. While he's running away, he sees this weird, scary-looking black dog staring at him, and it's freaky. Anyway, he takes this thing called the Night Bus, don't worry, I'll be talking about that later, to Diagon Alley, where Arthur Weasley tells him about this bloke called Sirius Black. Sirius Black is a big supporter of Lord Voldemort, who has recently escaped from Azkaban Prison, hence Prisoner of Azkaban. And because Harry was the one that got Voldemort killed, Black is searching for Harry because he wants to kill him. So when they get to Hogwarts, they find that the whole school is under maximum security with these freaky-like prison guard things called Dementors, which are big, scary, black, floaty shapes that suck out every happy feeling you have and have a particular impact on Harry because he's had so many bad times in his life, stationed all around the school. Stop anyone, Sirius Black, from getting in. Then nothing really happens. 
for a long time. There's only really one major plot point before the big finale thing. That is when Harry finds out at Christmas that Sirius Black is his godfather. He was friends with his parents and he betrayed them to Lord Voldemort. He's the reason they're dead. And he killed this dude, Peter Pettigrew, who was another one of his parents' friends. And Harry gets all pissy and decides he's going to murder Sirius Black. And then Daniel Radcliffe gives his most intense acting ever so far. He was their friend. And he betrayed them. He was their friend! I have goosebumps. Fred and George give Harry this thing called the Marauder's Map, which is a map of Hogwarts that says every single person in the school and shows them walking around the school, which is another just thing that happens, but it sets stuff up later, so I might as well bring it up. Harry looks at the map and notices that Peter Pettigrew is walking around. Peter Pettigrew? What? He's meant to be dead, isn't he? So he goes off and searches after him, but he can't find him, and he tells his defense against the Dark Arts teacher, Professor Lupin, and Professor Lupin's like, that's not possible. That's and Hermione keeps randomly appearing, like she's not there at the start of the lesson, and then halfway through the lesson she's suddenly there. Weird. Also, she's been taking far too many classes, like she's taken more classes than is actually humanly possible to be taking. What is going on? Lupin and Harry form a sort of bond, a relationship. This is because of the Dementors and the effect they have on Harry, so Lupin teaches him how to get rid of them using this thing called a Patronus, which is when you think of a wonderful thought, any happy little thought? and then point your wand at the Dementors and say, Expecto Patronum! And it goes, Psh, white light comes out and it's like, Fwah! There's not very much else I can say because there's so many pacing issues. At one point in the film, it is their first lesson of the year. Literally 20 minutes later, it is Christmas. Literally another 20 minutes later, it is the last day of the film. And then that day lasts an hour. So, and I can't really talk about anything that happens in that hour without giving spoilers, but I'm going to anyway. So there's this creature called a Hippogriff, which Hagrid is looking after, that attacked Malfoy. So Lucius, Malfoy's dad, said that Buckbeak, which is the Hippogriff's name, has to be murdered, has to be killed, executed, that's the word. So the gang go to give Hagrid some moral support and they see Malfoy there and he's laughing about it and then Hermione smacks him in the face, which is pretty awesome. Anyway, so Buck beats executed and the three of them get trapped by the Whomping Willow while they're out. Because the dog that's been following Harry around all year grabs Ron, who's holding his little pet rat, and drags him under the Whomping Willow. Cue the shittiest action sequence in the world with Harry, Hermione and the Whomping Willow, which eventually leads to them going under the Whomping Willow. <laughs> They end up in the Shrieking Shack, which is like the most haunted house in all of Britain. They get inside and they find out that this dog that's been following Harry around all year isn't a dog, it is Sirius Black. <laughs> is the scary man who can just change himself into a dog the whole time and he's here he's like, I'm gonna kill you! And like he starts shouting and he's got his wand out and everything. And Harry grabs him and pulls him to the floor and he points his wand in his face and Sirius Black goes, yeah, Are you going to kill me, Harry? <laughs> are you going to kill me, Harry? And you're like, oh my god, Gary Oldman is amazing! And then Lupin comes in and he points his wand at Harry and goes, Expelliarmus! And Harry's wand flies in the air! And Lupin is helping Sirius Black! What is happening? Well, Sirius Black isn't actually the baddie! The baddie was Peter Pettigrew all along, who was only pretending to have been killed! And so Sirius points his wand at Ron, and Ron's like, I'm not Peter Pettigrew! And then he goes, no, your rat is! What? The rat gets loose and he's running away and they point their wand at him and he explodes out and he is Timothy Spall! Whoa! This whole time in these whole last three films, Scabbers, the rat has been Timothy Spall. That is a twist and a half. Boom. It was actually Peter Pettigrew all along that framed Sirius Black and was the one that betrayed Harry's parents. So they capture Peter Pettigrew and they start heading back up to the castle to clear Sirius Black's name. But oh no, Lupin starts to change into a werewolf albeit a shit one. He tries to attack Harry, but then Sirius turns into a dog and attacks the werewolf and a fight ensues. Everything's going crazy and the werewolf's about to kill Harry again, but then a howling noise comes from I don't know where, and then the werewolf turns and chases that instead. And so Harry goes after Sirius to make sure he's okay, but he's really weak from the fight, and then the Dementors are closing in because they're after Sirius and they're about to kill him and they start sucking his soul out and everything, when suddenly, from nowhere, a Patronus comes out from across this lake. And it comes over towards them and it's in the shape of a 
stag and it blows all the Dementors away from them and they are safe. Except they're not because Sirius Black is captured and he's going to be given the Dementors kiss which means his soul's going to be sucked out forever. And Harry's all like, the guy that saved us was my dad, I recognised him, he was my dad even though you don't quite see his face. And then Dumbledore comes along uh, and he tells Hermione and Harry that they have to go back in time to the events at the start of that night and fix it all. Hermione gets out this thing called a time turner and says, this is how I've been getting to all my classes and why it seemed like I've been popping into classes halfway through. And they spin it three times and they end up like a couple of hours ago at the start of the night. So now they can go back and change things so that it ends better. Will they change things for the better? How will they try and change things? Will Sirius Black get away? Will Peter Pettigrew get away? What will happen? Goodness, I can't take all this emotion, except I can. Why? Because it's not done very well. Bad. Okay, here we go. So again, they've decided to make the film darker than the last one. This, I'm sure, is quite an easy decision to make. The plot itself is a lot scarier. The Dementors, as an idea, are terrifying. Harry comes within an inch of actually killing a human being. So yeah, the plot's a lot darker. So they've given the film a darker feel. And I would say, unlike with the last one, I would agree with that decision here. This film should be darker. In which case, why fill it with such ridiculous humour? Just constant all the way through. Horribly zany humour. The entire Aunt Marge scene is painful to watch. As she's expanding and getting fatter, her buttons ping off, hitting Dudley in the face, and he just bleh, gets knocked out, and it's not funny. She's making noises like, woo, woo, which aren't funny. There's big orchestral music in the background to give it a more dramatic feel, which juxtaposed with the ridiculous things that are happening on scene are meant to make it funny, but it's not funny. It's just stupid. It feels really childish, which completely undermines the whole idea of the film being darker. The same with the night bus. Oh, the night bus. For some inexplicable reason, there is a talking head voiced by Lenny Henry, which just cackles like a madman, just screaming in your face, this scene is funny, this scene is funny, this scene is funny, it is not funny! It's too much in your face, stupid stuff. Just the most base humour. Like the bus suddenly breaks and Harry whacks his face into some glass. And then it breaks again and Harry whacks his face into some glass. And then they have to shrink to fit in between two massive double-decker buses. And Harry gets all elongated and stretched. And the shrunken head says, why the long face? Ha 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 ha! It's just all so cartoony. The fat lady was fine as she was. She didn't need to be played by Dawn French. I love Dawn French. I think she's hilarious. But the fat lady doesn't need to be funny. And with Dawn French when she's acting scared going, Aah! it's just annoying. It's just annoying and it's not funny. Fred and George, the twins, they've always completed each other's sentences and stuff. But now they're actually, they talk in unison. And I don't, it, is that meant to be funny? I don't know if it is. If it is, it's not. It just feels stupid. And it takes you out of the whole reality of the film. It just doesn't work. If you're going to make it dark, make it dark. If you're going to make it cartoony, make it cartoony. Make a decision. But if you're gonna go with cartoony, then at least try and make it funny. Some bits are genuinely funny. Daniel Radcliffe's acting, for example. Oh my fuck! Why is he in this role? You'd think he'd have calmed down by now, but no, he's still out of breath. When he does, I'm gonna kill him! Surely when they were filming that scene, why not just say, okay, we need one more take when you're less out of breath. But no, they just decided to go with it. And that call, along with many others made by the new director, Alfonso Cuaron, is despicable. Why are you employed? You're a terrible director for not making him do another take. And while we're on the subject of acting and weird directorial choices, sadly, the brilliant Richard Harris, who played Dumbledore, died before Chamber of Secrets was released. And that is terrible news. And trying to find anyone to fill in his shoes would be an impossible task. But at least try. Instead they get Michael Gambon, who's famous for playing hard nuts. <laughs> what is going on with that accent? Is he Irish? Is he English? There are moments like when he's running up the stairs to go and talk to the fat lady and there are students in the way. Dumbledore would say, excuse me, and everyone would part. Instead Michael Gambon's going out of my way, get out of my way. He is not Dumbledore! I could go on for another 10 minutes about why Michael Gambon is so wrong, but instead I'm going to talk about Ron again. Rupert Grint is the best out of the three. He is the best actor out of the three main characters. So why are you still making him this weedy, shitty character? Come on! Sort it out, Alfonso! I've already mentioned the pacing issues, but so I'm not going to go back into them, but I mean, come on, this is ridiculous. I know the plot of the book itself does make it difficult because so much happens towards the end of the story. So yeah, they have an excuse for weird pacing, but that doesn't make the fact that it's there any better. So it turns out that Lupin's a werewolf, right? Wrong. Because that is not a werewolf. This is a werewolf. This is bollocks. 
Werewolves are meant to be scary and intimidating. He's not scary. He just looks like an ill man. Which is fine if you want to humanise the werewolf, but you don't. You're meant to be scared of it. If there's no tension, because you've got a shit werewolf, then the power of the scene's lost, and it is. Another scene that could have been brilliant, but turned out shit, is the Whomping Willow fight. Again, it's the same zany humour. I showed that clip earlier, when Hermione comes past Harry, grabs him, and he goes... And then gets yanked off. Firstly, that took far too long. He should have got whipped away earlier than that. But despite that, it's meant to be an exciting scene. Why put that in? It just makes you cringe that this is meant to be funny, but it's not funny. Oh my god, that's the problem with the whole film! That whole scene is ridiculous. <laughs> there are plenty of other problems, like a bit at the start, where there are boys mucking about in the common room and it just feels really awkward. And the ridiculous exposition scene explaining that Sirius is Harry's godfather, it just feels drawn out and so forced. And a bit when Harry's in his invisibility cloak and he starts fighting with Malfoy and Malfoy thinks he's a ghost. It's just, it's all so ugh. But it wouldn't be fair of me to just concentrate on the bad things. I'm biased because this was my favourite book, so I will talk about the good stuff too. The good? It's not all bad. Well, it's mostly bad, but it's not all bad. Like I said, at the time of this film's release, the book of Prisoner of Azkaban was my favourite book. This is because of its awesome plot. Yes, there's pacing problems, but the ending, the last couple of chapters, oh my god, they're so good. Mostly because of the whole time travel story at the end. I love time travel stories. Actually, no. Correction. I love time travel stories where the time travel works. This film has a thing called a closed time loop, which is my favourite type of time travel story. It's the one where everything sort of fits in the most neatly, and I love that about this film. The time travel stuff is really clever. So that's a thumbs up. The Lupin and Harry relationship is quite subtle, but nice. It's generally a more cinematic film. The shots feel more movie-ish. The Dementors, like I mentioned before, are terrifying. They're well done. So that's an instance of CGI being put to good use. The same with the Hippogriff and the dog. They look really good, except for the Hippogriff flight. That bit looks a bit meh. There are a couple of moments, not very many, but a couple of subtler humour, like some short transitional shots between seasons with the Whomping Willow are genuinely titter-worthy. Snape's back in it, he's got more to do, which is awesome. This whole scene where he's got this line turned to page 390. Four, is brilliantly done by Alan Rickman. Hermione's character too is getting better. She's still no at all, but she's more of a human, as shown with the really good moment when she punches Malfoy in the face this moment. <laughs> oh, oh, four. Talking of Malfoy, he's more of a twat now, which is Brill Sticks. And again, where usually brilliant actors like Dawn French and Pam Ferris are put to poor use by playing shitty roles, Emma Thompson, who plays Professor Trelawney, really does herself justice. She's genuinely almost funny. Yeah, I think that was fair. There was some good stuff there. So what's the verdict overall? The verdict? Okay, I feel like I've said everything that needs to be said, so let's just cut to the chase. Prisoner of Azkaban is one of my favourite books of all time because of the awesome plot, which is probably why this film upset me so much. Ready for the rating? Here it comes! Awesome story! Shame about the film. And with that, he lost what little internet following he had. I don't care, it's what I believe and I'll stick to my guns. If you absolutely hate me for it, fine, put it in a comment. I don't even care, fuck you. As some of you may know, I'm going to Comic Con this weekend to air the first trailer for Smashed, which you can find in my channel, and to release my first ever ebook, Time Dancer Sliders. Oh, it's so exciting. Because of this, I'm not going to be able to have time to watch Goblet of Fire and review it by Tuesday, so I'm officially moving the worst of first day to Thursday. From now on, all the videos will be up on Thursday. So get excited, because a week from now comes the next review featuring a special guest, the same one from today, Dot Heritage. She'll be doing a little bit with me. How exciting is that? Brill sticks. I am really sorry it was so long. Until then, fan more of fellow fans of film and fiction, and remember to stay geeky. Mwah.